Hello, this is Patrick Hickey from Boho Bui Comprehensive School and in this video I'm going to talk about Anglo-Irish relations from 1932 to 1939 under Fianna Fáil and Eamon de Valera. And I suppose as we'll see in this video, Ireland will make tremendous strides in terms of our sovereignty. So to begin, 1932 de Valera became president of the Executive Council but he also took on the role of Minister for External Affairs and I suppose this gives us a good idea of how important he actually saw this job in that he wanted to take it on personally himself. Now as we'll see on the de Valera and Fianna Fáil relations with Britain will become more strained. As we saw in a previous video where we looked at Fianna Fáil's economic policy Dev took the decision not to pay the land annuities to Britain. We also saw that between 1932 and 1938, both countries were engaged in an economic war. Dev inherited an Irish free state that was still very much a dominion of the British Empire, a situation he would never be satisfied with. So Dev, piece by piece, set about dismantling the treaty much to Westminster's displeasure. As we'll see, he will take full advantage of the Statute of Westminster. First up, in May 1933, the Daw passed a law removing the Oath of Allegiance, the same oath that had caused a civil war in Ireland. Dev also set about abolishing the Office of Governor-General. And he did so in a very interesting way. Now, when he came to office, the Governor-General was the King's representative in Ireland. And the man in the position was James McNeil. Dev and his government set out to ignore him and snub him at every possible occasion. Eventually, McNeil resigned. Dev now appoints his own Governor-General, uh, Donal O'Bukala. He was a friend of Dev's, a man who hated the limelight and who had just lost his seat in the recent general election. He was also a lifelong Irish Republican and a veteran of the Easter Rising. Now he was the King's representative in Ireland. I suppose you couldn't get a man um, less appropriate. But this was the man now who was given this job. Obukla quite willingly used his position to undermine the position. For example, he swore the oath of loyalty to the king in Irish. He also decided not to take up residence in the vice regal lodge. Uh, today we call it Oras and Uchtaran, but rented accommodation in Monkstown. Now, not surprisingly, the post was finally abolished in 1936 and there was no great protest from Obukla. In actual fact, his life's work had been achieved in that, there was no, that, in that the king was no longer uh, represented in Ireland. Next up, Dev abolished the right of appeal to the Privy Council. Up to this point, Irish court cases could be appealed to the Privy Council in London. Now, of course, the British weren't too happy with Dev's action, so they actually appealed his decision to the same Privy Council. It actually supported Dev's decision on the grounds that the Statute of Westminster allowed him to take this action. From this point on, the court and the Irish Free State had the final say in all law cases. 1936 was a very dramatic year. In that year, Edward VIII abdicated the crown in Britain. He's here pictured with the love of his life, Wallace Simpson, the woman he gave up the throne so he could marry. So he could marry her. Now, Dev used this constitutional crisis to introduce the External Relations Act. This removed all mention of the king from the Irish constitution. However, the Free State remained a member of the Commonwealth and the King was still recognised as the head of the Commonwealth. 
So 15 years on, Dev had achieved the external association he had sought during the treaty negotiations. By 1936, the Free State Constitution was in tatters. So it was time for Dave to press the reset button and draw up a new constitution. What we call today Bunrock Naharan, the Constitution of Ireland. Now, the constitution was put to the people in a referendum. It passed narrowly, uh, 56 to 44. Now, What it said and what it introduced included the following. The name of the new state was ERA. Um, We no longer have the president of the executive council. That position now became Taoiseach, the title we still have today. We would have an elected president. Uh, Article 2 claimed political jurisdiction over the whole of Ireland. Article 3 stated that as long as there was partition in Ireland... ERA's laws would only apply to the 26 counties. In 1938, following an all-party agreement, Douglas Hyde, the founder of the Gaelic League, became our country's first president. So, with a president as head of state, and little or no interference from Britain in Irish affairs, as you can see, Irish sovereignty had come a long way under de Valera. However, surprisingly, Dev stopped short of declaring Ireland a republic. Why? Well, I suppose a long shot, at best, but he was still leaving the door open for a 32-county Ireland. He felt declaring a republic at this stage would make unification between North and South an impossibility. Now, 1938, and again we covered this in a previous video, Anglo-Irish relations improved greatly that year with the signing of the Anglo-Irish Agreement. This agreement ended the economic war between Ireland and Britain. And as I said previously, it was a great deal for Ireland in that the land annuities were sorted out, it ended the tariff war, and of course, vitally at this time, given that World War II is only around the corner, we get the treaty ports back, back. And such were Anglo-Irish relations. The British at this stage seem confident we will assist them in any subsequent international war. However, as we'll see in the next video, this was not the case. When World War II was to happen, Ireland adopted a policy of neutrality. So we will look at this and more in our last video on Anglo-Irish relations. I hope you'll tune in. All right, that's it for me. Again, uh, wishing everyone um, well, and I hope your studies are going well also. Uh, Till next time, all the best. Bye-bye.